This weekend, we're talking money and cryptocurrencies with our in-studio guest. Peter St. Ange is a professor of economics at Fengjai University in Taiwan, and he earned his PhD at George Mason University. He's also a former Mises Institute summer fellow, and he blogs and offers a free Austrian investing newsletter at his site, profitsofchaos.com. Peter wrote a brief but interesting Mises Daily article last week dealing with the thorny question of regression theorem as it applies to cryptocurrencies. So we'll dive deeper and ask Peter some of the fundamental questions about money in this electronic age. What do Menger and Mises tell us about the origins of money? Where does money come from? How do we define it? What's the difference between money and a medium of exchange? And was Hayek right about degrees of moneyness? Stay tuned for a great Austrian discussion about the one thing everyone wants more of, money. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Mises Weekends. I'm your host, Jeff Deist, joined today in studio by our guest, Peter St. Ange. Peter, how are you today? Thank you, Jeff. It's great to be here. Peter, you wrote a great little article for us last week entitled Cryptocurrencies and a Wider Regression Theorem. Now, I like this article because it seems to take a middle point between two extreme arguments, one of which is that Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies fail to satisfy Mises' regression theorem, and therefore they simply can't be money under any scenario. Or the second extreme, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies unquestionably are money, and if they don't comport with regression theorem, then we ought to discard and throw away Mises' regression theorem altogether. Yeah, well, the approach that I sort of view uh, Bitcoin is that it is a good like any other. So like any other good, it gives us certain benefits. And if it does those benefits well, then people will demand it. And the fact that it actually exists in the market, it's had value now for a couple of years. So that suggests in a way we know the answer to the puzzle from the beginning because we can see this thing living in the wild having, you know, a relatively stable value, right? You know, it doesn't fluctuate between one penny and a million dollars, right? It's relatively stable. So we know that it is apparently um, a good with some durable demand. Therefore, it must be offering some durable benefits. And so then the trick is just to find what these are. So that's sort of the approach that I take to looking at something like Bitcoin is just take the uh, sort of magic veil away, right? And treat it just like any other good just like you would treat an iPad or a house or anything else. Peter, Menger, of course, famously provides us with an explanation of the origins of money as commodities. Should we be viewing cryptocurrencies as a form of commodity? It depends on what your definition of a commodity is. You know, there are a number of different views. So one sort of standard view of commodities is that it has to be something concrete that you can drop on your foot, right? So in that sense, of course, it is not. But again, you know, if we look at it um, basically from a praxeological point of view, then a commodity would be anything that offers some kind of benefit, right? It doesn't necessarily, you know, have to um, have to drop it on your foot. Uh, it doesn't have to be concrete. It doesn't necessarily have to be limited in value or scarce. Uh, there are many goods that are not scarce, like air, uh, the air we breathe and so on. Depending on your definition of commodity, uh, it would or it would not. But I think that praxeologically, the key question is, is Bitcoin a good? Meaning, does it offer to some people in a better way than the other things like fiat money? Peter, your article discusses the antecedent value requirement for money under the regression theorem. Let me give you a quote from the theory of money and credit. Mises states, it follows that an object cannot be used as money unless at the moment when its use as money begins, it already possesses an objective exchange value based on some other use. Now, taken literally, does this require a non-monetary antecedent use for money? Right. And that's sort of uh, what I aimed at in the article is that I think that you can read Mises in two different ways, and he makes this distinction throughout human action. Uh, but one question is, what's the praxeological function that he's discussing? And then another sense is, uh, what is the history of some process? And the history and the praxeology often conflict, right? And I think that this is one of the cases where they do. So within human action, when you read the surrounding text, right, where he discusses the regression theorem, it seems quite clear that he's saying that any any true money must have been metal. He seems to clearly think that it must have been some commodity with a non-money value. So something pretty or, you know, whatever uses gold and silver, for example, had. And I think that the trick there is that 
you know, you can look at that as kind of a failure of imagination. So in other words, had Mises known about Bitcoin in 1912, then I imagine that he would have written that passage differently. What he was doing instead was, you know, looking back through whatever, 5,000 years of human history, he observed that the only durable commodities that have developed into free market money are metals. So I think that Mises there is mostly describing history. There had never been anything like Bitcoin before. Uh, it is 1912, so I don't fault him too much on failure of imagination. You know, I couldn't imagine Bitcoin three years ago. Now, we oftentimes hear the term medium of exchange. Can you talk about the difference between money and a medium of exchange? I think that medium of exchange, I kind of like that term to start with because it describes what's happening here. So money fundamentally has two benefits, which are enabling transactions and enabling savings. And so medium of exchange, I think, captures what money is doing, right? Savings, when you say that money is enabling savings, really, of course, the only reason it's doing that is because it can be used to enable transactions. So the reason why you would want your savings to be held in one thing over another is because fundamentally, at some point in the future, you can transform those savings into some kind of exchange, right? And there's, you know, some, some purchase. So I think the functions of money sort of boil down to enabling transactions. And so I like sort of starting with medium exchange because it describes praxeologically what money does. And then the next question, you know, the sort of broader term of money, I think, has uh, a number of different definitions, it sort of carries a lot of baggage. I use the term, of course, you know, because it's a, it's a common term, but I think that it's less uh, precise. So among the burdens that are placed on money are, for example, being either universally accepted or nearly universally accepted across a given geographic region, being a common unit of account, for example. Right. So there, there are those sort of extra burdens placed on money. And again, I think that the distinction is a little bit that between praxeology and, and history, where to call something a money, you start to import all of these historical traits of money. Where do we stop with that? Right. So, you know, do we require that money has presidents, faces on it, you know, things like that. So, you know, there's sort of historical descriptions of money. But I think that when we go back to the praxeological core, that the true function of money, the reason why it is a distinct phenomenon, the reason why we would study it is because fundamentally it acts as a medium of exchange, meaning that it enables transactions. And as a derivative function of that enabling of transaction, it's also used for savings. So those are kind of the two um, core values. And, you know, when we're discussing something like Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies in general, uh, because they, you know, have only existed for a couple of years, if we're going to apply any sort of historical trait of money to them, we're not going to get very far. We're starting with our conclusion if we start saying that, you know, anything that's going to be a true money has to resemble historical money in some way or another. So I don't think we get very far with that. We may as well just uh, cut out the middleman and say, OK, fine, Bitcoin doesn't look like traditional money and we're done. So I think we, it's much more fruitful, right? If we're going to ask whether Bitcoin is a future, it's much more fruitful to start with the praxeological definition, in which case I like using medium of exchange. I think it makes it really clear what money is doing. How does this process occur? How does the transformation from a medium of exchange to outright money occur? Is this simply an empirical question? A couple of moving parts in that process. One of them is that there are gains to scale, right? So there's sort of a, a network effect. So once something is uh, used as money in a particular area, then because it's their lower transaction costs on using it, the winners keep on winning. So you've got a network effect where there's a tendency for one single money to dominate in a geographical area. It doesn't have to be a country, right? It can be a region or, or such. And then the other, I think, moving part in that transformation from, you know, medium of exchange to sort of money with a capital M, sort of a dominant form of money. I think the other moving part there is that governments often try to get involved in this. They try to um, privilege or burden um, different media of exchange. Typically, of course, the media of exchange that they most try to privilege is the pieces of paper that either they print or that their friends print on uh, licenses, right? also known as fiat currency. I think that when we look at the transformation from medium of exchange to money, those two, right, the network effects and the government uh, burdens, uh, to me anyway, are the most interesting. So in the denationalization of money, Hayek talks about, in effect, degrees of moneyness, by which he mostly means degrees of liquidity. So is he right? Are there degrees of moneyness or is money binary? Something either is or is not money. 
Rothbard talks about that on, uh, as well, of course, much later uh, in Man, Economy, and State, Chapter 11, where he uh, talks about quasi money, right? So, you know, he, he's specifically interested in things that pick up a lot of moneyness, right, in the Hayekian sense. But the idea is that any particular good is going to have a certain amount of demand based on what the good does for you. So, you know, if it's a pack of cigarettes in a prison, then, you know, cigarettes have a certain value for certain people. But then once they pick up this exchange function, then you get this additional layer of demand that stacks on top of that. And so that's going to tend to increase the price, right? But what's interesting there in Hayek's conception is that what it implies is that essentially everything in the world has some degree of exchange-related demand, right? So we were talking yesterday, Jeff, about Lamborghinis, used Lamborghinis, right? So a used Lamborghini mostly has value for what it does for you, right? You can transport the groceries, you can impress your friends, uh, but there's a certain amount of probably a very slight amount of value that's piled on top of that, which is that in a pinch, right, you can trade that Lamborghini for money. Now, if there were draconian laws against selling Lamborghinis so that you could only keep that Lamborghini for yourself and you could never use it as a unit of exchange, well, then it would lose some value, right? Probably not that much, but it would lose some value. Now, of course, on the flip side, if you were to take, say, you know, US dollars, the vast majority of their value, of course, comes from their exchange use. They have very few purposes beyond that, although people in Weimar Germany did use them as wallpaper, apparently. Right. Currency is fairly durable for that. So, right. So, on the other hand, um, if you were unable to exchange dollars, then they would lose almost all their value, right? So, you can sort of mentally imagine if it were illegal to exchange some particular good, how much would its value drop by? And that's going to give you a rough estimate of how much of its original value is coming out of exchange as opposed to use. Peter, shifting gears slightly here, let's imagine a scenario where tomorrow Ron Paul's famous competing currencies bill passes both houses of Congress and it's signed by the president. And the next day, Americans are allowed to use whatever mediums of exchange or money they care to use within the confines of these 50 United States. What would that look like over the coming days, the coming months, the coming years? What would competition in currencies look like? Short term, I don't think that there would be that much of an impact. And the main reason is that in the grand scheme of central bankers, uh, ours are not particularly bad. Central bankers, of course, all evil. But the problem is that the main competition to the U.S. dollar today is the Canadian dollar, the euro, the Japanese yen, right? These are, in practice, uh, the main competition. And those central banks are really not much better than ours. Uh, exchange rates have been fairly stable. Uh, so my guess is that what will happen over time is that demand for U.S. dollars uh, in order you know, to use them to buy things, right, that would decline. Some of that would be picked up by foreign currencies. So, for example, in you know, Southern California or uh, Maine, right, prices might start showing up more in Mexican pesos and such. But I suspect that that wouldn't happen a whole lot. The main function would be that it would be a little bit more of a control on our own uh, central bank. So it would sort of be a threat hanging over their head that, look, if you guys do behave more irresponsibly than the neighbors, then at that point, you could start getting a snowballing effect where demand could bleed away for the US dollar. So just sort of to paint out a specific scenario, if the Canadian central bank was relatively conservative and the US central bank started going wild, in that scenario, if you were permitted to use Canadian dollars for transactions, then you would expect a large amount of demand to bleed off the Canadian dollars. Uh, this is what happens in a lot of countries today, right? If they have relatively incompetent or uninvolved uh, police, then, you know, countries will start transacting in foreign currencies. In Mexico or Argentina, places like this, people use uh, U.S. dollars for a large <laughs> amount of their transactions. These are typically, right. it's typically illegal to do this, but the countries don't really do anything about it. Of course, historically, Mises talked quite a bit about gold and silver. Austrians have generally favored hard currencies, uh, precious metal backed currencies. In a free currency environment, do you think Westerners would today use gold and silver for exchange and payments? Frankly, I imagine that some enthusiasts would do it, just like some people like to be paid in Bitcoin today. But frankly, again, because the value of the U.S. dollar is relatively stable, we all know a lot about money and we're, we're, we're kind of interested in it. We you know, pay attention to the economic effects and such. For the average person walking down the street, a dollar is good enough. Right. You know, if it's losing two, three percent of its value, once you include productivity gains, it's probably actually losing about 
six or eight percent of its value a year. But for most people, they don't really care. <laughs> you, know, you know, for transaction demand, which is what you keep in your wallet, it wouldn't even matter for us, right? I mean, we all, you know, carry some Federal Reserve notes as well. Even for savings demand, two, three percent nominal inflation, in other words, erosion of the money, just doesn't seem to bother people that much. So I don't think in the short term it would change um, a whole lot. Again, it would mostly come into play if the Fed got significantly more irresponsible. Uh, but having said that, even today, of course, right, we were talking at the top of the program that the government can't repeal the market. So even today, I mean, there are a significant number of people who carry Canadian dollars or you can carry foreign currency. It's relatively easy to smuggle. There are people who transact in gold and silver. There are people who hold their savings in gold and silver. Right? So even with the various tax burdens or various use burdens, for example, uh, that the government puts on competing media, uh, still there is a very healthy gray market you know, for both metals and for foreign currency. And to the degree that the Federal Reserve got more irresponsible, even if the laws weren't changed, we would expect that market to grow tremendously. In closing, Peter, thank you so much for joining us today in studio, and thank you for an interesting interview. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to follow Peter, find him at his site, ProfitsOfChaos.com. That's profits like profits and losses, ProfitsOfChaos.com. Once again, thanks for joining us, and have a great weekend. 